Good morning, commissioners. I'm going to go ahead and open uh, the Zoom to allow the participants uh, to start coming in. So just a note. Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the November 3rd meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Um, I, we will begin with a uh, roll call. Commissioner Bertrand? Present. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Commissioner Mon uh, Commission Alternate Hurst. Right here. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commission Alternate Quinn. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. <clears throat> Commissioner Parker. Commissioner Rockin. Here. And uh, Ms. Ochoa, uh, Monroy Ochoa from Caltrans. You have a quorum. Okay. We will now move on to um, any uh, additions or changes to the agenda. Okay, hearing none. Have handouts for item 21 that have been posted to our website. Th thank you. Okay, uh, we will now take oral communications. This is a time for members of the public to address the commission on items that are not on today's agenda. And I will take speakers. I don't see anyone here in person, so we'll begin with our uh, virtual audience and start with our Quinn 008. It, I think it is too, Ro that's Robert, yes? Okay, so he, Robert, are, did you have an oral communication or were you just heading into? Just saying he's here. Heading it, yeah, okay, got it. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, our next speakers, uh, Michael Lewis and, or, and Jean Brocklebank. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Michael Lewis. Jean Brocklebank is here on this Uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been spending a great swan of my time recently in the draft environmental impact, impact report for the Coastal Rail Trail. As you may be aware, this is a 966 page document. It is extremely complicated. It is confusing to read. Some of the language is contradictory, and um, I'm having a hard time getting through it. But I'm working way uh, day by day. My main concern with this document and with the project itself is this consists of a, uh, in this case, a 1.6 mile clear cut through the urban forest, particularly in Live Oak. And it talks about removal of trees, but this is not just removal of trees. This is the destruction of habitat along this corridor that consists of not only the trees, but the understory grasses and herbs and uh, forbs, they grow on the ground. This will be destroyed and removed uh, from this corridor in order to create this uh, recreational sidewalk and bike trail. Uh, and not only uh, is it removal of habitat, but it's the removal of a critical wildlife corridor that connects the uh, riparian areas of the streams that flow down from north to south. And this is not only the construction of this trail that will 
continued operation will be a, a constant interruption of this wildlife corridor. It's a, it, it's a very critical corridor for birds, uh, mammals, bats, and lots of other creatures who not only move through this area, but who also live and roost here. Uh, in this day and age, the city and the county are both very much concerned with climate change, and they de developed elaborate procedures uh, to deal, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The removal of these trees removes a significant uh, greenhouse gas sequestration opportunity. These trees have been there, many of them for hundreds of years, the mature trees. They have sequestered an enormous amount of carbon in the atmosphere. They have <coughs> carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they produce oxygen. Even worse with this project is there is no mitigation for the removal of this uh, carbon sink that is so critical to the, our, our local contributions to greenhouse gases. Mr. Lewis, um, I, I'm sorry, your time is up. So um, we'll start the clock over here um, for, for Gene. Oh, okay, we'll... Okay, thanks. Is there a way to show? Thank you. Hi, do I, uh, do I click start or do you click start? I see the clock. We'll, we'll, you, you can see the clock now. Yeah, we'll, we'll hit start. Um, okay. Go for it. Thank you. The viewing the DEIR for segment nine this past month has shocked me, but his plan is damaging and destructive and cannot be called sustainable or green by anyone with a straight face. The city's own EIR admits this throughout the document. You know, our European counterparts came to this place 150 years ago, and we then also settled in, displacing those living beings who were not us. We did this to people, and we did it to wildlife. Both were destroyed. We're now working hard to make amends to those humans whose homes we took from them for our Western civilization. Well, and get this, we continue with plans to do the same thing to the living beings of what the DEIR identifies as a wildlife corridor, especially through Live Oak. As we build housing for homeless people in this county, we're planning to destroy housing for wildlife by cutting down close to 400 trees and all of the underlying vegetation and cover the living soil that contains tens of hundreds of species of microorganisms with a hot asphalt trail. We are preparing to create homeless wildlife. Myriad of species of birds, bats, insects, small mammals, probably some reptiles will become homeless homeless wildlife. There will be no replacement homes for these species because even the EIR admits there is no feasible mitigation. This horrific scalping of everything green in this corridor is shocking. I wish people could see it. Mm -hmm. I wish everyone who's listening to this and everyone who is attending this meeting would walk through this. This action is gonna define who we are, define our morals and our ethical obligations to other living beings. Didn't we learn anything when we destroyed indigenous people? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brocklebank. Our next speaker is Barry Scott. Welcome. Good morning, uh, commissioners and staff. Um, I am. Uh, I'd also like to speak to segments eight and nine, and, and you know, and, and presume and, and looking looking ahead too to segments ten, eleven, and twelve. I am delighted, and I'm grateful to staff, city staff, RTC staff, and the consultants for their work on eight and nine, where we find out of, out of 14 different categories of study that the proposed project trail next to rail line is found to be the, uh, the environmentally superior solution. As we've kind of suspected all along, um, I might remind everyone too that we have the 73% rejection in June of a greenway idea and the railroad is an active rail line, and we 
our, our commission and our government and, and all of us have obligations to the state and to the voters to keep that rail line active and working. Now, I'll, I'll just read a bit from that. Uh, it's page ES6, kind of the conclusion. I didn't find the EIR difficult to comprehend. And uh, I know where to find the information that's worth sharing. Um, it says here, uh, the overall impacts of the build alternatives are similar and there's no clear environmentally superior alternative. Therefore, the city considered two measures to determine the environmentally superior alternative, minimizing the significant and unavoidable impacts. And number two, environmentally superior for most resource topics. As I said, 13 out of 14. Using both measures, the proposed project ultimate trail is considered environmentally superior for the following general reasons. Um, and I'll go down to alternative one trail only, more impacts. That's the that's the takeaway here. So I uh, thank you for your time and uh, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Our next speaker is, I'm looking for hands here. Sorry about that. No worries. Just one moment. We'll get on to the next one. Um, it looks like uh, Michael Saint, you are up next. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, good morning, commissioners and staff. Michael Saint with CFST and Aptos resident. This morning, I'd like to go back to October's meeting and give Brett Garrett two thumbs up for his rail cat presentation. Uh, I've known Brett for seven years, and to his credit, he has not wavered in his beliefs of PRT as the answer to a modern mass transit system in Santa Cruz County. The two things that excite me about the rail cat is it has the potential of actually carrying more people than a single rail train and is being discussed as is being discussed presently. And it can feed passengers to the main rail trail corridor by itself. By extending the rail cat to other parts of the county, Cabrillo, UCSC, Watsonville, Dominican Republic, or <laughs> Dominican Hospital, etc., you can reduce the use of not only cars, but metro buses. Imagine as our buses get older, we retire them instead of replacing them, a huge financial windfall. I would also like to thank Commissioner Johnson for his excellent question last month about will roads be necessary if we have this more advanced technology like a PRT? The answer is yes and no. Roads will still be here, but need to be repurposed for PT PRT service, protected bike lanes and pedestrian traffic. I can imagine and envision in the future that 41st Avenue, Ocean Street, Mission Street, becoming two, possibly three lanes of cars with reduced speed limits of, i.e. example, 25 miles an hour, with calming features, the remaining lanes for a PRT system and protected bike lanes. A PRT going into the city of Santa Cruz, Pacific Avenue and other streets could be closed to cars and used for pedestrians and more outside dining. This could also be a future possibility for Commissioner Johnson's beloved Scotts Valley. PRT up to Felton, extensions down Mount Harmon Road and Scotts Valley Boulevard, also using calming, traffic calming features. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Our next speaker is Joanna Lighthill. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I too wanted to comment about the EIR. Uh, Michael and Jean said quite a bit, and uh, I was want to echo their sentiment. Um, what I wanted to um, mention is that the summary does um, conclude that the project proposed project is the way to go. However, um, the it, they reach this conclusion because every alternative project but one ends up with the same trail. The options are whether to do it in phases or not. Fewer phases mean uh, less environmental destruction. So um, what the study doesn't talk about, though, and it has concerned me for a long time, is the proximity of the trail to an active rail line. The RTC, of course, is currently in contract with the rail operator. And although no freight is currently moving through the section, set, segment nine is what I focused on mostly. Um, it's my understanding that the rail operator 
owns a freight easement of 10 feet from the center. And this trail is being proposed to be built within eight and a half feet of the center. So before making uh, decisions about, you know, future trails and this trail, I hope the commission will discuss what long-term safety um, mitigations are necessary. Um, especially since today's agenda includes further uh, study of rail. Um, I just want to point out that in the earlier sta stages of planning the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, um, it was envisioned, uh, I saw a transportation cafe video that the RTC put out early in 2011 or 12, and it was there that staff mentioned um, that this trail was envisioned as a place where grandparents could walk with their grandkids uh, safe separation of users of different speeds and abilities. And I hope that we'll reflect on what the original intention of the trail is in comparison to what is a reality for today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Lonnie Faulkner. And um, if anyone else is interested in oral communications, now is the time to raise your hand if you're out there. Uh, otherwise, uh, Lonnie, you'll be our last. Uh, speaker for oral communications. Thank you, Chair Brown and Commissioners. I recall in the September 4th, uh, 2022 meeting that commissioners unanimously voted to solicit proposals mm -hmm. for the initial phase of the PAED for electric passenger rail with a budget of approximately 4 million. Um, staff indicated they expected to return to the commission with a recommendation for a consultant contract award at this first commission meeting uh, this November. Uh, the agenda is silent regarding the expected consultant contract and there now appears to be a reduced 2.5 million budget allowance for this rail work in the Measure D uh, five-year program of projects. There are considerable efforts and monies allotted by the RTC towards widening of Highway 1 from State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard, a project phase which was not approved by the voters of Santa Cruz County as a part of Measure D 2016 despite Caltrans own reporting that highway widening is met with induced demand, we continue to see this project prioritized. We are hoping to hear more about progress on the PAED phase of development of our passenger rail system, keeping in mind the overwhelming support by voters for passenger rail for our community this past June election in prior surveys, and given the work the community has done over the past 20 years to bring rail to our county and in enabling us to connect to the future state rail network. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if our director could respond. I've also received questions and I know that commissions um, have, has, has received some emails about this. I'm just hoping you could give an, an update course, response. Thank of you. Of course, Chair Brown. I, I planned on addressing this in my director's report, but I, um, I will do so now. Um, um, uh, the speaker is correct that at the last RTC meeting, I indicated that staff intended to bring a recommendation for a consultant for the rail and trail project for the commission to consider at today's meeting. Due to our very competitive procurement, staff decided to conduct a second round of interviews to ensure that we selected the best possible team for this very challenging project. Staff now has a top ranked firm and has started negotiations. We now expect to be able to make a recommendation at the December RTC meeting. Thank you. Uh, I see Commissioner Rotkin has a comment as well. Yes, thank you. I have a brief response to our first two speakers. Um, of course, people can disagree about these things. And I don't claim any expertise about what the long-term impact of climate change is on microbes in the soil, but we're often faced with difficult choices about what the long-term prospects are for the various projects we engage in. And the issue of uh, having an alternative to people driving in their automobiles through this county that's presented by the uh, train and trail complex that we're, we're planning uh, will certainly reduce climate change uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases that lead to climate change significantly and probably have a positive and relatively positive impact on all the animals that the two speakers uh, referenced as well as of course human beings on the planet and so uh, I don't want people to think that when they make comments they just go into the ether and we don't hear them uh, I heard the comments I understand their thing it's, it's a 
unfortunate that we're often presented with difficult choices. But for me, the choice of doing something that dramatically reduces uh, climate change is in fact the correct choice for us to be making, not just for human beings, but for wildlife as well. Thank you. Thank you. I see, and um, we have uh, another commissioner wishing to speak. Uh, commissioner Johnson, you're up. We have been going to be doing back and forth uh, based on the comments from public comment time. Um, I, you know, usually we take it, we we digest it, but I I, I don't recall having you know commissioners all of a sudden respond to public comment uh, in, in this way. But if if that's what uh, the chair wants to do, that's fine. So oh, um, I'll, I'll just respond to that and say uh, we generally don't uh, from time to time in my time on the commission, um, commissioners have felt moved to make a comment and I, that happened. So I'm not encouraging it, but um, I am willing to to let people speak if uh, so moved. And um, we did get a response from uh, Director Preston. So uh, I'll, um, but, but I appreciate your uh, your concern, Commissioner Johnson, will um, try to keep moving. So our next agenda item in that spirit is a presentation from Santa Cruz Metro. And we have John Ergo, Planning and Development Director here with us uh, via Zoom to uh, provide us with uh, an update. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Commissioners and the members of the public. Uh, I have a few slides, so I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Great. Hopefully that will work. Okay. Okay, uh, so I wanted to take this opportunity to <clears throat> briefly share with you all a set of strategic goals and vision that Metro's new CEO, Michael Tree, uh, who apologizes for not being able to be here, by the way, and staff set forth before our board uh, about two weeks ago. <clears throat> and these are focused on ridership, uh, climate change, and affordable housing. So in terms of ridership, uh, we're aiming to double our ridership within the next five years. Zero emission vehicles, we've set up only purchasing zero emission buses moving forward, converting our entire fleet by 2037. And in terms of affordable housing, we're aiming to develop 175 housing units at Metro Transit Centers within the next decade. So I'm going to touch briefly on all of these. The first goal, doubling ridership in the next five years. I wanted to start with a little bit of context and how we came to set this goal. Um, you know, as we were or right before the pandemic hit uh, in the winter of 2020, ridership had actually increased uh, over the previous year. That's the blue line there, and this is comparing. Um, as a percentage of the last pre-COVID year, 2018 to 2019. As the pandemic hit, obviously, uh, and the shelter-in-place orders uh, came into effect, riders have decreased 92% to a low of 8% in April 2020. And we cut service about 50% um, in order to protect our operators from the spreading pandemic. As the shelter-in-place orders, you know, began to get lifted to some extent, we pretty much immediately began to restore ridership, uh, sorry, began to restore service, the red line there, uh, to about 80% of pre-COVID levels uh, early on in the pandemic. Ridership took much longer to return. Uh, and for, for a lot of the year, the, the last two years, it often felt like we were providing too much service for the relative, compared to the amount of ridership we were seeing on our buses. But that was intentional. And, and the, the intent of that was to make sure the service was there when people were ready to return. For example, in 20, September 2021, we saw a huge spike as uh, students began to return to UCSC in limited fashion. Schools reopened in person and greater segments of the economy reopened, um, which we were able to handle because the ridership was there. And that was all made possible. Uh, by the fact that we were able to maintain our operational budget through uh, Measure D, which funds nine fixed route operators, uh, TDA and STA funds, State Transportation Development Act and Transit Assistance Funds, uh, and successive rounds of federal stimulus. 
that enabled us to, to maintain our workforce, to maintain our bus operators employed, uh, to be ready for ridership to return. During the, the winter of January uh, 22, we saw the Omicron spike ridership dipped down pretty dramatically again. But the last uh, couple of months coming through the summer into today have been really positive. Uh, so total ridership currently as of September 2022 is 91% of pre-COVID levels. UCSC ridership is 104% of pre-COVID levels, so actually more this September than it was in 2018. Non-student ridership was 87% of pre-COVID levels, and Highway 17 is 57% of pre-COVID levels. We're probably seeing a spike associated with the return of UCSC students in greater numbers than they did last year. Um, the three-month average is about 71% of pre-COVID levels, but it's all good news that I wanted to share with you all today. Taking a step back and looking a little farther back in history, meeting our the ridership goal that we set uh, would bring our metro ridership back to levels last seen in the early 2000s. Um, so it's, but we think that's a reasonable goal uh, to achieve given where we are today and the recent growth we've seen uh, in ridership as we've come out of the pandemic. As we went back and looked through the history, and this is common across transit agencies. Ridership tends to track very closely with uh, the service provided or revenue hours. There's often a misconception that uh, ridership is heavily impacted by, you know, recessions, unemployment rates, changes in the economy. Uh, and that is all true to, the ex to an extent, but the greatest driver of ridership is simply the amount of service that a transit agency can provide. That is impacted by external economic factors, but were there a way to maintain a stable source of operational funding, ridership would stay more or less stable. And achieving the goal that we've set will likely require an increase of service uh, to levels, uh, to previous service levels as well. So if we're gonna invest in new service, um, how should we do it? For those of you that were at our board retreat uh, two weeks ago, this is, uh, stolen from Jarrett Walker, who presented there. But we have two options. Uh, we can set a ridership goal, which involves us thinking like a business, uh, focusing where ridership uh, potential is highest, supporting dense and walkable development, uh, maximum competition with cars, and maximum VMT reduction. Or we can set a coverage goal, which is which would involve thinking more like a public service, providing access for all, supporting low density development, and trying to ensure that every member has some access to a little bit of service at least. We think we're currently right in the middle, 50% uh, ridership, 50% coverage. Most of our routes throughout the district operate at headways of 30 minutes or less. Uh, this is actually pre-COVID service. The red line on the west side serving UCSC is not currently running, but it was our only service that operated at 15 minute or better headways uh, prior to the pandemic. And the rest of our service, the vast majority is hourly uh, or worse. So we uh, we asked the public recently, we had a, a phone survey uh, during the first two weeks of October. Uh, we had a thousand respondents, uh, adult ages 18 plus residents of Santa Cruz. And we wanted to ask this specific question about how should we invest um, future and in, in future service and there was we asked many questions i'd be happy to share all the information i just want to highlight two responses so the overwhelming or not the overwhelming but nearly half of non-riders so people not currently on our buses reported they would be likely to ride metro regularly if buses came more often so they they want frequency um if there was a bus running at least every 15 minutes uh near their near their place of residence or workplace. We asked uh, everybody a set of questions on how we should potentially invest new resources. And again, the response was overwhelmingly towards frequent service over broad availability. Nearly 70% uh, said they'd prefer providing fast and frequent service that comes every 15 minutes versus providing service to as many places as possible. Uh, even if that means the bus only comes every hour or two. And that was across uh, all respondents and even those that 
uh, our current riders are right a few times a year. So that has set the stage for our next phase of this work, which will be a bus network reimagining plan. Our proposals are actually due today uh, on this project. And over the next uh, one to two years, we're going to be developing a five-year plan, uh, setting out this vision for doubling ridership over the next five years. It will be phased uh, and involve three scenarios. One is cost neutral. So are we making the best use of our current resources in our, in our network? And then we'll look at two growth scenarios uh, should additional resources become available. Um, we, we have had some additional resources become available in the recent past. So we added service to Watsonville uh, through a grant uh, from the Low Carbon, Low Carbon Transportation Operations Program. We're currently offering a fare free service on zero emission buses connecting to key destinations. And we'll continue to look for funding opportunities to do this guided by the work and the reimagining plan going forward. Um, other projects we're focused on towards ridership uh, involve investing in speed and reliability. We also heard this throughout our survey. Uh, another project that just kicked off and will be going for the next uh, one to two years as well is the Line 71 Rapid Bus Project, which aims to identify locations for transit priority elements, such as queue jumps, bus boarding islands to improve travel times and reliability between Watsonville and Santa Cruz along uh, the main and Soquel and Capitola corridors. And this is funded by a Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Grant. Uh, and we're also looking to improve the customer experience. So we've got a computer aided dispatch automatic vehicle locator program about to go live. And not only will this provide useful internal resources for scheduling and on-time performance, but it'll also provide a public facing uh, way for customers to access real-time information throughout our system. And this should be launching in February of next year. Uh, and finally, on the, the ridership front, we're constantly working to expand access to fair products. So we've got uh, our program with Go Santa Cruz, which provides free transit passes to downtown Santa Cruz employees. There are plans to expand this through uh, the Go Santa Cruz County program. And we've also had a mobile ticketing uh, app that launched in 2021 with a contactless credit card payment option uh, for Highway 17 buses coming very soon again, focused on making it easy for people to access fair products wherever they are. Um, quickly on the last two goals. So we've spent a lot of time figuring out how we can meet the California Air Resources Board uh, innovative clean transportation rule, which requires us to convert or to purchase only zero emissions, uh, zero emission buses by 2040. Um, and the first phase of this was the procurement of four electric buses, two of which are running uh, in on the Watsonville circulator. The next phase will be to convert 100% of our fleet serving Watsonville to zero emission buses by 2027. And the third phase will be the full conversion of our 96 bus fleet by 2037. We modeled three uh, scenarios to get to this goal. The first was um, just purchasing CNG buses going forward. Most of our fleet is CNG until the CARB regulations uh, kick in. Uh, the second we modeled was a gradual increase, so kind of a you know what we're doing now, purchasing a few zero emission buses. And the third would be only purchasing zero emission buses going forward. And I'll be honest, the initially number one or two was where we were headed, and that was simply because the cost of a CNG bus was half that of a electric or hydrogen bus. But due to recent supply chain issues uh, and the COVID pandemic, the cost of a CNG bus has increased uh, 25%. And the cost of uh, hydrogen and electric buses have decreased due to various federal and state incentives. And so it made it financially possible to pursue bill number three. It will still cost 130 to $140 million uh, and that is just the bus cost, the bus replacement cost that does not include the infrastructure of fueling. And the majority of that will be funded by Measure D. There's a lot of sources on that pie chart, and I apologize for that. The point of it was just to highlight Measure, measure D is the critical uh, backbone for our bus replacement plan. And it not only is the largest source of revenue for, uh, for the bus replacement plan, but it also enables us to leverage uh, as a local match for various federal and state programs. And then finally, 
uh, the goal to develop 175 housing units in metro transit centers. By any by any measure, Santa Cruz is one of the, if not the most expensive housing market in the country. And so we are determined to do what we can uh, to help alleviate that burden on our customers and our employees, uh, frankly. So one, I'm sure everyone is familiar with redeveloping Pacific Station, the joint project between the city of Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz Metro. This will be over 100 units of extremely low income and low income housing, a new bus station in Tarmac, lead platinum all electric net zero building. But we're also looking at our other properties throughout the county. So one is the SoCal Park and Ride, and the other is the Watsonville Transit Center. And I'd say we're currently in very conceptual planning stages on, on both of these ideas, but we think we can potentially fit another 75 units between the two of these. Um, so that's it. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any, and thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Ergo. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, very, um, very inspiring to see all the work that's happening. Uh, I'll take questions, comments from commissioners. Uh, I'm gonna go, I, uh, Commissioner Hurst has his hand up. I'm gonna uh, call on you and then I'll catch you next, uh, Commissioner Koenig. Okay, Commissioner Hurst, you're up. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Mr. Ergo, thank you very much. And it's uh, refreshing uh, and satisfying not to see the Watsonville forgotten in this uh, mix of uh, metro and transit you know it's um a, an underserved community that really needs these services and i want to say thank you for thinking of us and uh, making sure that equitable resources are provided uh, to this direction so that's that's my comment thank you thank you commissioner koenig you're up thank you chair thank you for the presentation director ergo uh, my question is, is both for you as, as well as for our RTC staff here. Um, you know, it's exciting to be moving forward with the uh, bus on shoulder and auxiliary lane project. Um, however, as we've heard numerous times from members of the public, um, there's you know, some concerns that the combined auxiliary lane and bus on shoulder project will mean it's, it's not a true bus on shoulder, that the bus will still have to share that lane with private vehicles and could experience some slowdown as a result. I mean, don't get me wrong, it'll, I, I think it'll be better than the status quo and I'm excited about the project as it is. But um, my question is, I mean, we're still, we're, we're adding shoulders with the highway project. Is there an opportunity for a phase two bus on shoulder, more of a, you know, the true bus on shoulder or traditional uh, bus on shoulder where the bus can actually use that shoulder in a in its own lane and are your two staff discussing that opportunity at all thank you mr koenig if i could i i would defer to rt staff rtc staff on that question yeah and mr ergo uh, sarah christensen is here so we'll go ahead and turn it over to you thank you chair brown i'm sarah christensen of your staff um I manage the bus on shoulder projects and um, we see our current project as a step in the right direction. It will be um, very beneficial and transformative for this community. However, we do recognize that there will be future opportunities to enhance the facility. An example of that could be um, as we improve interchanges over time, we can um, add ramp metering and sync with the bus um, system to kind of hold traffic so that the bus can have the priority. Uh, so we definitely have been talking with Metro and collaborating on future enhancements into the future because um, I think there will be opportunities to do so. And if I can elaborate a little bit further, um, Approval to operate on the system is subject to um, an operations agreement with Caltrans and CHP. Um, CHP has significant concerns about running buses on shoulders. Shoulders are, um, in their minds, um, a safety zone, a clear zone for a disabled vehicle to um, uh, park in while they wait for assistance for emergency vehicles to go through. Um, it was very difficult to get them to come to an agreement with us on um, something that we could implement today. And that was the hybrid approach. 
Now, somewhere down the line, if um, we find that there are concerns um, regarding the sections where the buses actually will be um, running in the shoulder are overstated or can be mitigated, um, we could certainly work with them to uh, to see where where we can make improvements in the system so that the buses can operate better. But you do need to remember that if the buses are operating in a true shoulder, there are two con you know there are twice the amount of conflict potential conflict points um, at the ramp locations, and that is a, an area that we need to to consider. And so, um, I appreciate Sarah's comments about the other improvements that we may be able to make on the highway because a lot of the concerns about the buses getting stuck in the auxiliary lanes are associated with the configurations of those intersections. Um, we have very short hook ramps at SoCal Drive. We have two very closely spaced intersections between 41st and Bay Porter. Those are additional projects that should be considered for the highway um, to ensure that operations work for everybody. Great. Thank you. Uh, just to add one last comment, which is having uh, been recently in, in Denver, it's pretty amazing how they have their bus rapid transit system well integrated into the highway um, and with the stops right there. And so um, it's, it's clear that a good bus system can work fantastically well on the highway. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to make progress with that first with this first project and then uh, with others in the future. Thanks. Okay, uh, Commissioner Quinn. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Ergo. That was uh, very informative. I'm just curious when you mentioned that if the buses were more frequent, obviously more people would take the bus. When you're designing that, how do you, what's, it's also going to drive up the cost. What's the tipping point for ridership when you increase bus frequency? What percentage capacity do you want to see the buses running at? So we, we typically want to see about 20, we measure productivity and passengers per revenue hour. And a typical standard is around 20 to 25 passengers per revenue hour uh, for a productive service. We were at that at about uh, half of our routes pre-COVID. We're currently only meeting that in our UCSC routes. And since the COVID pandemic hit, we're still trying to meet that measure on our, our major inner city routes. What the bus reimagining plan is gonna do is develop two scenarios on this ridership versus coverage dial, where we'll be able to model um, what the level of investment and frequency is getting us. And we'll be able to talk to the community about priorities, essentially. Do you prioritize the level of coverage so that everyone has some access? Or if we're really focused on ridership, can we dial in that direction, which will mean less coverage in some areas, but more frequent service on the key corridors and destinations where more, most people are traveling through the county? Um, and that's a discussion that we'll have with the public and we'll also be able to model through uh, that scenario development. The first phase will just be a cost neutral. So our existing resources, if we change the dial, what does a frequent network look like versus a coverage network? And what kind of productivity would we expect to see with that? The next two phases will assume a future level of investment. We don't know what that is, but assuming that we are able to find additional operating funds, what would have uh, more frequent service look like that. And, and likely that will mean a, a frequent service overlay. So we're doing this line 71 project and that is envisioning a future service that's a rapid limited stop uh, service that operates every 15 minutes between SoCal and Watsonville along the SoCal corridor. Um, so that's, that's, that's where we're headed in the next year or two with this planning study. Appreciate it. Okay. Do we have any additional comments or questions from the commission? I do not see any, so we'll take it out to the public. And uh, our, we have a couple of hands raised. Um, now's the time to raise your hand if you would like to speak. Um, I see Michael Saint is um, our first caller. You're up, Mr. Saint. Yeah, thanks, Chair Brown. Uh, very nice presentation, Ms. Ergo. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Real quickly, I know this is a five-year goal, <clears throat> but in the future, uh, do you, have you thought about serving the rail corridor with mass transit? Do you see an increase in service? Um, and with that question, if we were to put in some type of public uh, rapid transit or a public one, 
that could extend out by itself, would you see a decrease in bus service since it was feeding itself? And we're looking at the future now, not just the five-year program. Sure. Uh, yeah, we haven't developed those plans, but we would certainly be gearing service towards the rail corridor and major transit nodes of development should that or when and if that uh, service is started um because that we want to be able to feed people into it okay thank you okay um thank you i will call on our next speaker that is brian from trail now Hi, it's Brian Peoples from Trail Now. Great presentation, Alex. Um, great work. It's exciting to see the that you're back up from COVID numbers. You know, probably about seven years ago, I met with um, former CEO of Metro, Alex Clifford, and another colleague of mine, and and he talked about the same thing. The service, uh, the key is providing the service to the public that they want, and that service is really frequency as you said frequency of that that bus line and what he said was it's a funding issue we don't have the money and we're we're pulled away from that being able to do that and he also said the unique thing about the buses it's their rubber wheels and so they have that flexibility to adjust to the public demand and alex was actually prior to santa cruz was the head of Chicago rail and, and transit. And what really was interesting, what sh what Alex said when we talked about the idea of a passenger rail, Alex specifically said it would be the worst thing for our community. Uh, and the reason was is because it pulls away valuable capital and resources, and it makes no sense. That's what Alex said. And a good example of this, we're seeing it today, with uh, segment 7B or 2, which is costing more, the, the trail is costing more to build this narrow expensive trail than it is to widen the highway. And so when you have um, not effective planning and infrastructure planning, you end up spending more money on those those resources and it takes away from our buses and that's really the message that we're trying to to send here is let's have some smart investments so that we can increase bus transit that's truly what our community needs thank you again for your time hey our next speaker is nancy yellen I, I'm sorry, I don't know how that happened. I did not put my hand up. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll move right along then to David Loves Public Transport. Uh, good morning, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, I'm David Van Brink and I live on the west side. And uh, I've commented before how the uh, relatively new Route 18, you know, uh, kind of just changed everything for us uh, on the west side. It's this like 30 minute service that goes well for myself anyway, exactly where I need to go, you know, up the hill from Safeway. Like if I bicycle down, sometimes I'll take the bus back up and a great connection to the Highway 17 Express. Um, so I'm just uh, coming to offer general kudos and uh, enthusiasm and support for the aspirational increase of uh, Metro service and uh, growing the ridership. Just uh, thanks. More of this, please. Okay, our uh, next speaker is Rick Longinotti. Welcome. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, yeah, I was really encouraged to hear about uh, Metro's um, plan to double ridership. And um, as I understand it, that's going to need some, some money. So uh, my uh, message would be, let's give Metro more money. Uh, we, you know, if we uh, increase the the service hours and the frequency and more people ride it, isn't that the direction we want to go? And isn't that the way to address not only our climate issues, but our social equity issues? You know, if people can, if households can get by with one less car per household because uh, riding the Metro becomes viable, becomes practical, uh, that's that's just a huge savings for people who who really need it. Um, I was also encouraged to to hear the discussion uh, that what we have in terms of bus on shoulder on Highway 1 is not really bus on shoulder. And I, 
I'm glad that that's now the currency of, of discussion on the on the RTC. Um, and I just want to clarify that you know the the uh, the proposal to run buses in the auxiliary lanes, whether they be uh, mixed with other traffic, was baked into the uh, the, the plan from the very beginning. The EIR, the engineering studies, never studied a bona fide bus on shoulder operation. So the thought of just adding sort of incremental improvements to these auxiliary lanes uh, really misses the point. Um, if we want a bus on shoulder project, we can have it. We can dedicate those lanes to buses, but it would be, it would require the the RTC to uh, to make a slight change of direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I do not see any additional hands up. So with that, I will thank you, Mr. Ergo, for being here to share with us and um, just really appreciate all of the work you're doing, the forward thinking. And uh, I'll use the opportunity to uh, once again, thank the voters for uh, passing Measure D, um, which I we just heard was uh, uh, making a, a real contribution to the transition to um, a clean fleet. So thanks again. And we will now move on to our consent agenda. Um, so our consent agenda is I don't that this is items five through 19 today. Um, no, five through 16, excuse me. Um, and these are items that are um, considered to be minor, they'll be acted upon uh, in one motion if no member of the RTC or member of the public wishes to pull an item uh, members of the commission can ask questions uh, or uh, raise comments without removing an item. I'll ask now if any commissioners would like to remove an item from our consent agenda or ask a question. Okay. Uh, seeing none, I will... Uh, Take motion. We ask the public if they. Oh, excuse me. Um, so actually, sorry about that. I usually ask the public after. Um, we, uh, Mr. Caput, Commissioner Caput, I see your hand is up. I, I was going to move to. Okay, we'll just we'll hold for one second and see if we have any sure. members of the public who are um, interested in commenting on any of the items on our consent agenda. This is items five through sixteen. Uh, I do see a couple of hands up. Uh, Lonnie Faulkner, you're up. Hi, thank you, uh, dear commissioners. I urge you to consider alternatives to the current proposal of item nine. Um, I, I, that would ensure more equitable representation across underrepresented groups throughout the county, including a call for and urging of submissions and full review of applications for all advisory board positions, as well as removals be reviewed by all commissioners resulting in these appointments. Um, we should be concerned when the power of appointments and removal of community volunteers for these advisory committees is controlled by one individual. Um, while recommended appointments and removals can be made by respective commissioners for each district, we hope that all commissioners will um, have some weight in review and the decision making. Um, I urge the RTC again to ensure more equitable representations from the greater public and avoid locking in um, power into one inv individual commissioner. Um, and also uh, didn't have a chance to look at this more thoroughly, but perhaps more streamline the term limits um, so that all terms are similar instead of this confusing three year term and four year term. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up, Paula Bradley. Ms. Bradley, you are, Bradley, you are able to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Paula Bradley, and I also have questions about item number nine, the bylaws for commission members. And um, with the, uh, on page 30 of the packet, the committee members appointed by the county supervisors would have a four-year term. Um, I was wondering, does that mean that uh, with each election, then the volunteer members of the 
committee would be dismissed or could be dismissed um, and start a new term. My second question is about the uh, process uh, where uh, appointments by supervisors uh, would be different than other members and other members would require a application process and board of supervisor or supervisor appointments would not i was wondering what the intention of having a, a different process uh, for diff for members on the committee um, i don't know why that would be uh, changed thank you thank you okay i see one more hand up so i'll call on you now barry scott and you, okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to, to agree with uh, Lonnie Faulkner as regards uh, appointments to uh, various various uh, committees and uh, and including um, alternates. Uh, where I uh, was surprised, whenever it happened last year, I think when our, our uh, I'm in Aptos, so I'm in District Two, and we I used to enjoy meetings with Patrick Mulhern until he uh, left the state. And I was surprised to see that uh, supervisor friend appointed Dr. Quinn in, I believe, a consent agenda matter with the Board of Supervisors meeting. And I was kind of surprised and I would have liked for, for a number of people to have been considered. We're kind of underrepresented here. Um, and I'd also like to hear back uh, respectfully, Dr. Quinn, to my request to, to meet with you from time to time. I enjoyed meeting with Patrick frequently on matters relating to transportation, but also things like Aptos Village Park projects and other things that I work on. So uh, that's my comment. And I hope that we can have a little bit more community involvement when it comes to naming uh, committee members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. <laughs> So I, I just because um, several members of the public brought it up and, and we did also receive some communications, just uh, hoping that perhaps somebody uh, from the budget and administration personnel committee or staff could just um, explain what this proposal is and and how it how it why it's coming to us today. Mr. Fulton. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. <laughs> my mic is on. Um, this proposal. Um, is it on now? Okay, sorry. Um, this proposal is simply a follow-up of the actions that the commission took um, several months ago to um, essentially decide that supervisors um, should be able to appoint representatives from their district. Previously, the there were five district appointments, but they were kind of at large appointments. And the commission decided, um, not unanimously, but decided to allow supervisors to make their own appointments. This, um, what's before the commission now is a change to rules and regulations that puts that change into the regulations. What was changed also from the staff recommendation, since at the Board of Supervisors, there are many uh, boards and commissions that have supervisorial appointments. What the board has learned is it's much more efficient to tie those appointments to the terms of the supervisors and make them uh, four-year terms so that uh, while a supervisor can remove uh, anyone, just like the commission can remove anyone from uh, the, the two committees where we have appointments uh, at any time. If a, the appointment is made, that person's appointed for four years and it comes four months after the supervisor, assuming it's not somebody who's reelected, uh, is elected. And that gives that uh, person time to decide, do they want to keep the person who's there? Do they not want to keep the person who's there? And they have the ability to then make the change, although they could make it at any time uh, if they so wished. So um, the committee recommended that change to um, sort of bring the appointments of the district, the supervisorial district appointments in line with what the, uh, how the county does it. 
uh, the concern that somehow um, as soon as a new supervisor is elected, the appointees from that district would be removed is not correct. They would continue to serve until the supervisor either removed them or appointed some appointed somebody else. Um, so I think to try to and this uh, as briefly as possible, what, what's being done is memorializing what the commission decided to do several months ago and rationalizing it so that it uh, would allow for longer terms for appointees and uh, a more efficient process for reappointing them or appointing them. So, thank you. I move the consent agenda. Okay, um, well, sorry. Sorry. Uh, okay, well, I've got a, a motion. Uh, sorry, we got we you got bumped, uh, Commissioner Caput, um, on the on the motion. Uh, but I'll give you the sorry. second. I'll give you the second, uh, Commissioner Caput. Um, sorry, I second it. Um, and so we'll um, well, we have a motion and a second. We'll call it for. Commissioner Caput, um, and uh, oh, we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commission Alternate Hurst? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Rodkin? Aye. That passes unanimously. All right, thank you. Um, so we will now move on to our regular agenda and uh, we'll start with item 17, commissioner reports. Um, Chair Brown. Chair Brown, if yep. I might, um, we do have a couple timed oh, items right. on today's Excuse agenda, me. including a public no hearing. Than, um, let's do that. So. Um, if okay with you, I suggest possibly moving item 17 through 20. Yes. To after item 22. Will do. Thank you. I, I've lost track of time here. <laughs> We're having so much fun. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that. And um, so we'll move item 17 through 20 uh, down and we'll um, now take up item 21. This is a public hearing on measure D, five-year programs, projects, um, and Rachel Morricone, our senior transportation planner, is going to give us a presentation. Take it away. Good morning, commissioners. Before you today is our annual updates to our Measure D five-year plans. Um, and we will have a public hearing. And this shows us how we anticipate spending Measure D funds over the next five years. So for those who aren't familiar with the Measure D that we're talking about today, um, voters in Santa Cruz County approved a half cent sales tax in November of 2016. Um, this is a 30 year um, transaction and use tax that um, revenue started to be collected in April of 2017. Um, and through the next five years, <laughs> revenues are anticipated to be between seven, 27 and $29 million per year. Um, and we're, we use these funds to identify local priorities. They're funds that cannot be taken away by the state. And so it really gives us a lot more local control over how we're spending money and um, implementing the will of the voters. The Measure D um, ballot measure included a voter approved um, expenditure plan and uh, that distributed the funds. Is it not Sherry? Odd. I thought I saw it for a second. It was a moment ago. Yeah. There it is. You're not. So if I go like that, you're still not seeing it? Uh. Odd. Okay, just a sec. Let me try to figure out why that's not going to presentation mode. Well, we'll do that at least. It's not quite as pretty, um, but at least that way you guys can see it. So the Measure D that was approved by the voters um, split up the Measure D revenues um, with 17% of the revenues going to active transportation or rail projects. 30% of the funds going out to local jurisdictions, the cities and the county by formula, um, with a small portion of that funding going to Highway 9 and Highway 17 projects. Um, highway corridors, 
uh, receive 25% of the funds and uh, transit agencies, including LiftLine and Santa Cruz Metro receive 20% of the funds and 8% of the funds are designated for the rail corridor. Um, so, oh shoot, so now it's showing all my slides instead of just my screen ones. No, I don't want that. Anyway. Um, so the five-year program of projects that are before you today are how we propose to use the funds over the next five years. So while the voters said, generally, here's the pots of funds that we want to send these funds to, the purpose of these five-year plans are to give the public an opportunity to provide feedback on how the commission anticipates spending the funds. Um, we take these to our committees. We have a public hearing to provide an opportunity for the public to provide input. And it also identifies um, for the Regional Transportation Commission specifically how you will spend the funds that are designated for those regional categories. Oh, Jesus, the pain. Um, sorry, guys. I thought I could share this by presentation. Um, so for the 2022 updates that are before you today, we're respreading some of the funds and adding funds based on updated project schedules, costs, prior expenditures, and grant funding opportunities. The commission also made some pretty significant updates in May of 2022, and those are reflected in these proposed five-year plan updates. Um, the only really significant updates this cycle are um, a proposal to add $2.4 million from the Highway 9 SLV category funding for complete streets in San Lorenzo Valley, um, adding funds for electric rail transit engineering and environmental analysis, um, and $34 million in additional funds for one of the Highway 1 projects. Again, we're focused on leveraging other grants, looking at opportunities, to utilize these funds to secure um, significantly more funding um, from state and federal agencies. A summary of the proposed updates are included as attachment two in the staff report and um, all of our previously programmed and approved projects are identified on our website and the commission's action today will also be reflected on our Measure D webpage. Oh gosh, all right. It's okay. Um, so for the Highway 9 corridor in San Lorenzo Valley, the Measure D ordinance designates exactly $10 million over 30 years for projects in San Lorenzo Valley. Um, the commission has utilized these funds in the past for the Highway 9 SLV corridor plan, um, access to schools in the Felton area, both studies and um, uh, safety improvements, and then the new $2.4 million for um, the Measure D complete streets elements. Um, currently, we're looking at putting those funds as a grant match for projects in the Boulder Creek area. Um, and this is just an overview map that was also included in the packet that shows you all of the Highway 9 projects that are currently funded. Um, for the Boulder Creek Complete Streets Project, um, staff did make a presentation in September providing an overview of some of the initial um, project elements that are being considered for that project. Um, basically, we're looking at addressing the fact that there's some long pedestrian crossings through Boulder Creek, there's missing sidewalks, there's um, non-ADA compliant sidewalks that are very narrow in some sections of Boulder Creek, and there's some aging transit amenities. So the project's really focused on making all of Boulder Creek, both on Highway 9 and 236, more pedestrian friendly. For the highway category, um, this includes still the three main auxiliary and bus on shoulder facility projects um, that have been um, pursued by the commission that also include several bicycle and pedestrian crossings and um, new railroad crossings in Aptos. It also includes funding for our traveler information programs and services, including the freeway service patrol roving tow trucks, um, the Safe on 17 additional highway patrol on Highway 17 to get drivers to slow down and assist them. Um, and then for the Cruise 511 or Go Santa Cruz County program. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah Christensen to talk a little bit more about the um, highway projects. 
Thank you, Rachel. I'm Sarah Christensen of your staff. Um, you could go next slide, please. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about the Highway 1 program. Um, these are three projects under development. The first phase being um, starting construction very soon. The contract was awarded. Um, so construction should be uh, underway uh, late this year, early next year. Um, the second project, which is between Bay Porter and State Park Drive, is um, very close to finishing uh, final design and is scheduled to start construction next year. That um, includes the replacement of Capitola Avenue overcrossing and the new bicycle pedestrian overcrossing at Marvissa Drive. Uh, but today's action is really about uh, the phase three project, which is between uh, Freedom Boulevard and State Park Drive. Uh, this project includes segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail. The project is finishing up the uh, environmental phase in early 2023 and as um, this commission authorized uh, beginning the final design phase a few months ago. Next slide. <coughs> so the RTC, next slide please, has uh, successfully used Measure D to leverage for competitive grants uh, as demonstrated by uh, the Senate Bill 1 Cycle 2 award of $107.2 million in 2020. Uh, staff is preparing applications for the next cycle of the same program, uh, which I will talk about in uh, subsequent, subsequent slides. Next slide, please. The additional funds recommended for today um, are for the Phase 3 project, which is the Highway 1 and Coastal Rail Trail, uh, segment 12 project. It will serve as local match for competitive grants and we're pursuing the solutions to congested corridors, local partnership program and um, trade corridor enhancement programs under the Senate Bill 1 uh, grant opportunities. Uh, as you know, back in May, we talked about financing quite a bit and this action may require financing if successful in uh, getting the award and dependent on the project uh, schedule. The project cost estimate was updated recently based on recent bid prices. Uh, this was mainly the 41st SoCal project. We opened bids and we got um, really geographically um, accurate bid prices as well as, you know, having it be so close to um, being so close to, excuse me, sorry, being so close to the um, grant application um, deadline, we thought it was prudent to update the project cost estimate um, at this time. Sufficient ca capacity exists to repay loans if the if debt financing is used. So we did check the cash flow model and um, based on the revenue projections, we do have capacity. Um, as you're aware, uh, we have the Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program. This um, program of projects was um, a result of the UCS back in 2019. It proposes multimodal and innovative transportation improvements along the three parallel routes as shown here. It serves as our comprehensive multimodal corridor plan, which makes us eligible for the competitive grant funding. Um, this was a result of a robust and collaborative planning effort back in 2019. The program of projects improves safety for all modes, relieves congestion, improves access, reduces vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. So the cycle three project, we've been collaborating with um, our partners, which include Caltrans, uh, the County of Santa Cruz and Metro. Uh, more details about the cycle three project can be found as attachment four to the staff report. The improvements include rapid transit improvements along 152 and Main Street in Watsonville to serve Metro cross county routes, improvements to the Watsonville transit station, in lane platforms, shelters, real time displays as contract three and green in the map and on the, um, on the fact sheet attached. 
and the County Soquel Drive multimodal project will extend the buffered and protected bike lanes um, all the way to Freedom Boulevard. It will include transit signal priority, adaptive signal improvements, and additional two and a half miles south as contract two shown in yellow. And then finally, the uh, contract one is in blue and that shows the highway one, auxiliary lane and bus on shoulder improvements, as well as coastal rail trail segment 12. And I just wanna clarify the scope of this project does include replacement of the railroad bridges, um, although it's not explicitly called out in the fact sheet. The purpose of the fact sheet is to be included in our grant application and the grant program because the project itself is not a, a rail project. It's not implementing any new service on the rail line. We can't really leverage the benefits of any sort of rail. And so that's why um, we don't really highlight it per se, but it definitely is part of the project because the, um, the widening of the highway requires the replacement of those bridges. Thank you for that clarification. Sure, yes. Okay, next slide. I think this is my second to the last slide. <clears throat> Excuse me, the Cycle 3 project was developed through extensive community engagement, which includes a recent update to our comprehensive multimodal, multimodal corridor plan, which is um, underway now. The team has made improvements and updates to the UCS to include this additional engagement and is planning to return to the commission to recommend adoption of an appendix to the UCS at a future meeting. This engagement led to the addition of transit stop infrastructure along Soquel Drive and 152 that Metro staff touched on earlier as the Line 71 rapid bus project. And this is in alignment with Metro's vision to increase frequency along this route. Next slide, please. And then just some highlights for the Cycle 3 project, because this is a transformative and multimodal project. Um, it includes comprehensive set of multimodal improvements along the three routes. It's a joint application. It shows a lot of collaboration between RTC, Caltrans, Metro, and County. We're pursuing the three, all three Senate Bill 1 programs, um, which is congested corridors, local partnership, and trade corridor enhancement programs. The project reduces countywide VMT, greenhouse gas emissions, travel times, and vehicle hours of delay. It improves safety and mobility for all users, and it enhances equity through adding and improving low-cost low transportation alternatives and reducing congestion for disadvantaged communities who disproportionately suffer from impacts of congestion. And I'm going to hand it back over to Rachel, and I'll be available for questions related to the highway program. All right. In addition to those, um, the Measure D five-year plans includes new funding within the active transportation or coastal rail trail category. Um, it continues to carry forward the committed funds for nearly 17 miles of trail. Um, this includes funds that are being utilized to leverage grants through the through federal and state agencies. Um, but in addition to that, the updates to the five-year plan include um, $350,000 designated for the new electric rail transit and trail project, which will look at um, some of the engineering and design work for segments um, 13 through 20 of the trail system. Um, it also includes updates to trail maintenance costs based on the discussion at your last board meeting. Um, and it also includes some additional funds for segment five, um, which are needed for the final design and right away services. Um, we, I also just wanted to mention that the commission continually meets with project sponsors and um, regulatory agencies to discuss implementation of all of these projects. Within the rail corridor funds, in addition to the small portion of um, Measure D trail funds that we're recommending for the electric rail transit and trail project, this program includes $2.5 million to initiate work <laughs> over the next two years on that analysis. It also includes about $6 million over the next five years for ongoing infrastructure preservation. This includes ongoing inspections and repairs, slope stabilization, culvert repairs, um, the matching funds that are being utilized um, for the Pajaro River Bridge grant that we received from the California Transportation Commission, Manresa Bluff erosion projects, <laughs> al along with some other additional ongoing maintenance. Um, 
Notably, we are not recommending funding all of the Measure D rail funds at this time. That is in part because we are still awaiting response from the um, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, on storm damage repairs. And so we need to reserve some funds until we know exactly how much they're going to reimburse us for some 2017 storm damage. We're also working through some final design options around the Manresa Bluffs and are also in negotiations with the um, consultant for the electric rail transit project as previously mentioned by our director. And so we do anticipate coming forward to the commission with some updates in the future, but for today, we're just trying to get some seed money to initiate some of that work over the next two years. And um, we'll be coming back with more. For the Highway 17 Wildlife Crossing, there's only one very minor change, which is that um, based on the project schedule, uh, we are actually anticipating a slightly smaller loan, interprogram loan from the highway corridors um, for this project. Uh, we are just now starting to utilize Measure D funds for the construction of this project, which is nearing completion. The Land Trust of Santa Cruz County was outstanding and has provided $3 million for the project, which covered the first $3 million of construction costs there. And we're also reducing um, anticipated staff costs on um, oversight of that project a bit. So Sarah already touched on a little bit on um, the fact that we are using these funds to expedite project delivery and leverage funds. Um, so far, we've leveraged over $300 million in grants or expecting to do so. Um, in the near future, in addition to asking the CTC for almost another 100 million for the Highway 1 project um, and some potential infra rural federal grants. So um, Measure D funds are a big deal. I mean, it's fantastic that we're able to go out to the community and to state and federal agencies and say, hey, look, we're ponying up our own money. We're a self-help county. Let's see what else we can get. Um, but in delivering projects to the community as quickly as possible, um, our revenues are not are insufficient to do this at a, as a pay as you go um, process. So we do estimate that we might need to bond up to one hundred twenty five million dollars <coughs> in the next five to seven years um, to implement all of these projects if all of the state and federal grants are secured. Um, but we've determined that that is possible um, and can be paid back through 2047 um, by Measure D funds. Skip that one. Yeah, just go down two slides. So today, the commission is reviewing these five proposed updates to the five-year plans. Um, we recommend that you consider public input. Um, some of those comments that we had received through committees and the community are included in attachment five of the packet and some additional comments are were distributed um, yesterday as handouts. Um, your committees did review these plans. They did not have concerns with the staff recommendations. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so with that, um, we'll go on to one more slide and we'll later today's agenda amend the budget to match whatever your decision is today. So after commission approves this, we continue to move forward with Caltrans, the cities, the county, um, and our you know consultant teams and staff to implement these projects and bring them to construction. Um, we're going to continue looking at every single grant opportunity and seeing how we can leverage even more funding from state and federal agencies. And then each year, um, for those who might not recall, we do have annual reports and audits. Those come from everyone who receives Measure D funds and the Commission's Taxpayer Oversight Committee, which serves independently of this committee, looks at all of the financials and the audits. Um, that are prepared on how funds were spent. And then we also have a strategic implementation plan um, that looks at how in the long term are we going to deliver the entire expenditure plan. And um, we are just now starting to update that strategic implementation plan. We try to update it at least every five years. Um, and we're continuing to look at opportunities to accelerate delivery, make sure that we're maintaining all of our um, trail and rail facilities. Um, and just continuing to look at what, what financing might be needed and other things. And then we, throughout the year, do ongoing outreach, and I encourage folks to check out the Measure D mm -hmm. webpage. Um, it has a lot of links to all of the five-year plans that are prepared by other agencies, as well as um, information, specific information on the projects that were discussed today. 
And then with that, um, I would recommend opening the public hearing. It seems like most people already know these rules, but uh, you can raise your hand and use the raise hand function and we'll unmute you. Thank you, Ms. Morricone and Ms. Christensen. We will, I'll now open the public hearing uh, and uh, let's see, I wanna actually, before we open the public hearing, I see a commissioner, um, you have a question there, Commissioner Johnson? Oh, yeah, um, and this is a, a minor, it has to do with Mount Hermon Road. And I don't know if it's appropriate to kind of throw in the needs and concerns of Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley into this mix. But as some people know, we've added a new target in Scotts Valley. And as many, many drivers, mostly who come from San Lorenzo Valley to make a left-hand turn from the valley into the target, the um, left-hand turn lane is not long enough to support the six, eight cars uh, that sometimes need to be, uh, have room to turn left. And so it extends into the traffic and it's a, a traffic hazard. So, you know, I think removing part of the island that is there right now and extending that left-hand turn lane is something that uh, concerns us and concerns the drivers. So again, I don't want to intrude on this five-year plan or whatever. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if it's appropriate to kind of include that uh, if, or are there are gonna be other means for us to kind of solve that problem. I can reply if you like. Go for it, thanks. So Commissioner Johnson, um, this the five-year plans that the RTC oversees would not be funding sources that are eligible to be utilized in Scotts Valley. However, um, Scotts Valley does receive a portion of Measure D funds directly, and that would be an eligible expenditure of those funds. Um, there's other grant opportunities also, competitive grant opportunities um, in the future that could be looked at for that type of project. Okay. So I, we've got uh, some commissioners who are interested in uh, weighing in. I we do we, this is a public hearing, so I do want to make sure we take it out to the public pretty quickly here. Um, if folks have questions now, um, then let's go ahead and do those, and then we'll come back for comments. Um, so Commissioner McPherson, I see that your hand was up, and then I'll. Yeah, I just wanted to come um, compliment the staff <clears throat> for putting this together. Six years ago, when we put Measure D together, it's a complicated uh, a measure that then, but it was because we included all transportation aspects. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice. <clears throat> but I just want to say thank you and um, and to um, really adjust to the moving target about how we're getting grants and what's available and and adjusting what we're going to do and when as quickly as we can to implement what we promised the voters in Measure D. I think they've done an excellent job in getting this together at this point, and I just think that should be recognized uh, and complimentary to the staff. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Rotkin. I have two questions. Um, you mentioned that we're not spending all of the money in the rail corridor. I, as I saw in this, if I read the chart correctly, is about 5.1 million that's not actually uh, targeted for particular expenditures. And you said that that's available, or maybe I forget one of the two, you said that that's available for dealing with um, the issues of FEMA doesn't come forward with sufficient funds to fix washouts and things like that. Is that money also possibly available for matching funds for grants and so forth? If it were it to, if it's not all necessary, I'm not trying to argue as a priority, but if it was not used up for the other kinds of things, is that something that could be potentially moved in that direction? Absolutely. And we are looking at a lot of different state and federal programs that might be available to help assist cover the full cost of the electric rail transit and rail. Um, environmental analysis. And, and that money stays in that bucket, let's say. Correct, say. correct. The way the expenditure plan and the ordinance were set up is that Measure D funds are designated for those specific categories based on the percentage set forth. By and my other question appears on page 2121. Mm -hmm. It's a chart of the um, rail trail with various colors. And it shows segment seven as completed green but it's still under construction. Is it just completed funding that's indicated in that chart or is 
should that be corrected to show that you know a piece of it's completed and the other is closed? It's being worked on right now. It's going to be done soon, but I don't. It's not completed. That's for sure. There was a lot of discussion about how to categorize these, but yes, in construction and completed, it should have a a slash mark there. Thank, Thank you for you. pointing that out. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Brown. I saw your hand up, but it's gone down. Do you have a question? Commissioner Rod can address the question that I had, so I, I lowered my hand. Thank you. Got it. Okay, uh, so uh, Commissioner Koenig, you're up next. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is in relation to the cycle three grants that we're applying for. Um, what are we obligated to as far as um, the rail trail bridges in terms of that application? I mean, I know with the other uh, grant applications that the city submitted for segments eight and nine and that the county submitted for uh, nine and 10, which are both looking, or sorry, 10 and 11, which are both looking very positive uh, at the moment with the, with the current scorings um, that we maintain maximum flexibility there in terms of what trail uh, we ultimately build. Um, and, and you know, as a sidebar, I, I totally recognize the uh, outcome of Measure D as being the voters want us to maintain maximum options and the possibility for a trail going or for a train going forward. Um, but I mean, I think in some sections like Aptos, which are ex particularly expensive to build that new adjacent trail, um, I, I do wonder if you know down the road, if we find that for some reason um, the, we, we just don't have the capacity to build a rail project, passenger rail, in the near future, if we might not want to look at another option like just covering up the tracks, not removing them, just covering up and using those existing bridges for an intermediate period of time. So I'm, I'm wondering if we have any, uh, if we have any options around that in the way that we submit the cycle three grant, do we maintain that or, you know, are we basically committing to building those bridges? I'll just so provide a general quick response, which is uh, the California Transportation Commission, Federal Highways, other grant tours, they look at project applications and they look at what are the benefits of this project and how did we score the project based on those benefits. Um, they recognize that during environmental review, during final design, um, sometimes projects might change from what was originally proposed. As long as you're not um, proposing a project that reduces the benefits of the project that were scoring criteria for the application, typically the California Transportation Commission will work with agencies on how to you know, reflect those. There are cases though, where project scope changes so much from what was proposed that they say, this is not what we approved. This was a highly competitive program, and we're going to have to pull back the funding from your project. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think that answers my question. Um, you know, just but it is a lot of money to, to put on this one piece of the project, um, that the one piece of the highway project. And, um, you know, I think given the uncertainty and uh, various project mix going forward, and as well as just the situation we face with the climate crisis and everything else, uh, future housing development within the community, um, that really it, it pays to retain as many options for as long as possible. Um, so yeah, that, and, and there's, as I said, in my, an earlier comment as we were discussing about Metro, um, you know, I think there's opportunities to improve transit on, on the highway potentially in the future as well. And so um, it might come that to, to the time comes when we decide that um, that's really a, a project that we want to pursue instead. Thank you, Commissioner Koenig. Okay, I do not see any additional hands up among the commissioners. Uh, so we will now take it out to the public. Um, before we do that, yes. we do have a 1030 item and we have our assembly members sitting in the audience. Yes. So why don't we hold public comment until we do the 1030 item? Unfortunately, we advertise the public hearing yeah. at 9 30. So it's only a tricking. It's a uh, tricking. It, 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 there's only a few hands up. So I was hoping we could just get through the public hearing. We start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you're right. <laughs> so have the hands up. We'll take. From the concern. Okay. Well, we'll take. Uh, and, and now the hands are going up. I see. Um, okay. So we, it, if it's all right with you, uh, Assembly Member Stone, uh, well, it'll hopefully be pretty quick here. Um, okay. So we're, we're going to um, do the public hearing. And uh, our first speaker is uh, Rick Longinotti. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I'm looking at a fact sheet on the cycle three project, including the auxiliary lanes from um, Freedom Boulevard to State Park Drive. And uh, the total cost was listed at 155 million. 
And that was that fact sheet was updated in July. And then the uh, the fact sheet that you have before you today, the cost was raised to 250 million. Um, so I, I I think you know you need to understand where you know where that cost increase comes from. And I also want to suggest that that's not the final cost because the, there hasn't been uh, completed engineering or EIR on this. So uh, what's the rush about this cycle three project? I mean, can we wait till we see the final cost estimate on this um, before making the commitment of measure D funds? The other thing I want to mention is that um, in the next five years, this cycle three is, is projected to get 88 million of measure D funds when there's only 63 million available in the highway portion of the project. So what that means is looks to me like it means borrowing money from some other bucket uh, and you know putting off whatever <clears throat> uh, improvements that, that would that you know in those other buckets. Uh, the other question I have is will the commission get to uh, review the SB1 grant application? Will that come before the commission before it's sent off? Uh, will you have a chance to review that? Um, I would suggest uh, putting off the entire uh, cycle three uh, uh, portion of this Measure D expenditure plan until after you've answered these questions and until actually after you've seen the results of the next auxiliary lane construction from Soquel Drive to uh, 41st Avenue and see if in fact the EIR on that is correct, that it actually increases delay in the evening commute. You may wanna change the whole uh, plan if, you, if, if that's true. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Longinati. Our next speaker is Brian from Trail Now. Hi, it's Brian Peoples from Trail Now. We have some literature and comments in there, so I won't cover most of that, but we have three main things we want to emphasize, timely implementation. Um, we're hopeful that we get a trail built within the next five years from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. Even if it's a simple gravel trail, we need to open the coastal corridor. Cost effectiveness. I've already spoken the fact that spending uh, the cost of a trail, a narrow trail costing more than widening the highway, is an example of how infrastructure planning is preventing us from investing in Metro. Um, and then most important, when we look at your proposed plan to spend money on the electric train, um, the Coastal Commission will regulate that decision. They actually have uh, denied three latest uh, agency, Santa Cruz agency uh, requests. And it's a very good example that you're not going to get approval for an electric train that is 20 feet from the from the. Pacific Ocean. Think of Park Avenue where it's 20 feet on the cliff. Think of Manresa Beach where it's 20 feet from the ocean. Um, we've asked that the, that the RTC staff actually reach out to the California Coastal Commission and do some prep work to see is it realistic that we will ever have a fixed rail system? Because based on our conversations with the Coastal Commission, they will never approve um, new fencing along the coastal corridor, preventing access and multiple trains driving over that. Look at Southern California. They're actually spending money to bring the trains in, inside. So we ask you to prior to agreement on this contract with the engineering firm, get pre-approval from the California Coastal Commission for your train plan. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown, uh, commissioners. Just two quick questions for staff. Um, when it gets to the EIR process, I know that's maybe a little ways off. This does sound like you're, you're rushing into this without too many good answers. Um, what sequent limits, sequel limits are you using for the cycle three or the um, number 12 seg segment for widening the highway and the multimodal use? Um, presently, you'll be under the new rules of lowering vehicle miles travel and greenhouse gas emissions. And I don't see how you do that with widening of the highway. Um, the tier one project that you're going through with now the ox lanes 
your own EIR says that there'll be a 29% uh, increase in VMT. So that's gonna be a toughie to meet, especially with widening the highway. My second question concerning the tier one EIR that's been set, about, set aside by a judge, is there any update on the new cost of recirculating the full EIR? You had a cost on doing it on just three items. And you said you may be coming back with a cost for the full EIR. That's my two questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saint. Our uh, last speaker will be Barry Scott. Welcome. Well, well, thank you. And uh, thank you, Assembly Member Stone, for your patience and letting the public speak a bit. And congratulations on your retirement. Your, your many years uh, are so appreciated and, and, and valuable. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about, and I want to thank to Bruce McPherson for mentioning Measure D, 2016 Measure D, which I remember comparing, I think, 17 different county plans for transportation uh, investments and on a sales tax measure. And our county was just blew all the others out of the water with respect to having a a share to active transportation, to transit. Most other counties were just roads and car centric. So it's really a great job that we had that. But that 8% to the rail corridor, I'm really concerned when I hear discussions that that never address the freight easement and the RTC's uh, obligation to return the entire line to a, a minimal uh, operational capacity. Uh, it's so important because the freight capability, we must never let that go. Um, it's our federal protection against removal of the line. It may provide some sustainable freight service in the future, but my real concern is that we just keep, keep all the bridges and the entire rail line in a freight capable condition, partly or largely because that condition is what provides us with resiliency in the face of climate change. The ability to uh, have a rail line that can serve as an emergency prevention, response, and recovery cannot be overstated. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's just not negotiable. The freight easement needs to be maintained. The federal government will, will, will protect that. And I hope that we see uh, every effort made to find funds to restore the bridges, to address drainage, and so forth. And I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Okay, seeing no additional hands, I'm going to close the public hearing. Move I, the staff recommendation. Second. All right. Um, so we have a motion and a second. I do. I, I did see that our staff was taking notes, um, and there some questions did come up during the uh, public comment. And so I, I want to make sure that we try to answer those questions, but I don't want to delay any longer. So um, if we could go ahead and uh, take the vote. Um, and when we come back um, after uh, our next item, uh, we're, we're going to recognize uh, Assembly Member Stone. Um, if you, it would be, it'd be OK to kind of respond to those on the funding uh, agenda item. They're related. OK, great. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. And I don't see any hands up. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a roll call. Commissioner Bertrand. I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hurst. Aye. Commissioner Caput. Commissioner Hernandez, are you sitting in for Commissioner Caput now? You're on mute. You're muted. We can read your lips. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Aye. Yes. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Rodkin. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, uh, so we are now going to take item 22 and uh, we will try to get your qu folks questions answered when we come back on our next item. Um, I, so I wanted to uh, take this opportunity. Uh, Assembly member Mark Stone is here um, and uh, will uh, say a few words um, and then we'd like to uh, show you some appreciation as well. So uh, welcome 
Assemblymember Stone. Thank you. Thank you. I was asked to come and give a brief legislative update. Although, as I remember, you have one of the best staffs here who keep you probably far better informed than I ever could about what's going on in Sacramento. I think Rachel knows more than most people about what's going on both in Sacramento and federally. And with the changing, the changing fiscal picture, your crystal ball has always proven to be very accurate as uh, she's kind of figured things out. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces here and in an incredible RTC staff and a lot of work over the years. And I think the picture that comes out of Sacramento is very similar to what sounds like you're looking at in your Measure D plan, that a lot of emphasis on the changing climate and impacts and what transportation really needs to look like in the future, as opposed to what it always has looked like. Moving away from singular vehicles, moving away from internal combustion engines, trying to electrify the transportation system, a lot of work on the grid and in some significant investments over the last number of years in that transportation system, pushing away from gasoline powered cars, trucks. I think the, the, the large transit sector is gonna be some of the most difficult, certainly electrifying buses, but the large haul trucks and things is, is something really that, that the airboard right now is, is currently working on. From what we've seen and the reports that are due out in the next couple of weeks, the budget picture is, very much changed for next year from the, the last couple of years where we've seen a real glut and been able to put some significant investments in a lot of different sectors, including transportation sector. So I think that's going to significantly change. One of the good news items over the last number of years is we've really pushed transportation revenues out of the general fund, away from the general fund, away from the clutches of the general fund. So hopefully, given the large reserves we have, the large rainy day fund that we have completely filled and more, and the fact that we've protected transportation revenues, a lot of the work that you do should be, as we go into the next economic downturn, a lot easier to manage than it has been in the past, those economic downturns. So we will get to see everybody in Sacramento right now is talking about caution in the budget. And I think going into the next budget cycle, we'll see a lot of reductions in those categories. But fortunately, the state has an obligation to keep the rainy day fund and the various reserves up pending the downturn. So I'm hoping that that will provide some stability over, over time. It's kind of the outlook. I think a little more bleak than we had seen before but also pushing in a lot of the right directions. And those directions that the state is going in really are the values that this county has, this Regional Transportation Commission has had over the years. And I appreciate the work that, that you do, some long-serving members, some more recent-serving members. But at this RTPA level, the work that gets done connecting Santa Cruz within Santa Cruz and outside is significantly important. And it's a role that's been handed to the RTC and you guys have always done a, a very good job. And from your executive director through all the staff, I just wanna say how much I appreciate your crew, your professionalism, the amount of work that you've always put in, in, in assisting commissioners, but providing information and, and being there to translate some very, tough concepts in the transportation realm out to the public. And it's interesting hearing the comments in the, in the public hearing. I'm glad that the public is still engaged. That's really all I have to say. Really, thank you. I've been engaged in the RTC in one way or the other for almost 20 years now. And I just very much appreciate the time, effort that all of you, the commission and certainly the commission staff have spent and the benefit you've provided in Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Assemblymember Stone. I uh, will look around here and see if anyone has questions. Um, well, um, I do have a, a resolution that I'd like to share, um, uh, but if anybody has questions before we do that. Happy to answer questions. Give you your, uh, your, your last uh, grilling of the, from the RTC, but it, it looks like people are, <laughs> people are, um, uh, happy to just hear from you today. Um, so um, if I could, I'd, I'd like to uh, share a resolution that uh, our uh, commission staff put together and um, 
and just say thank you and give others an opportunity. So uh, this is a special resolution in recognition of profound appreciation of distinguished service and leadership by assembly member and former Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commissioner, Mark Stone. Uh, whereas Mark Stone as an assembly member, county supervisor and Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commissioner has provided outstanding service to aid Santa Cruz County uh, RTC's efforts to improve transportation for the community. And whereas Mr. Stone has been an exemplary champion of transportation projects and advocate for a more sustainable Santa Cruz County, and whereas during his tenure as California Assembly member, Mr. Stone was instrumental in ensuring the passage of key bus on shoulder legislation, securing critical funding for transportation projects, programs and services, and supporting the advancement of regionally significant highway, bicycle, pedestrian and transit projects and ongoing maintenance uh, so critical uh, of the local street and road and transit system. And whereas as Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commissioner, Mr. Stone was instrumental in securing the purchase of the Santa Cruz branch rail line right of way, uh, making it possible to develop and construct the coastal rail trail uh, and continue the work towards future passenger rail service. And whereas Mr. Stone has always demonstrated a strong commitment and devotion to improving Santa Cruz County's transportation system, preserving its natural environment and fighting to protect the rights of all community members. And whereas Mr. Stone has continually demonstrated the highest level of professionalism, dedication and integrity, uh, Therefore, be it resolved that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission uh, or by us <laughs> that we formally acknowledge and extend our profound appreciation to Assembly Member Mark Stone for his unwavering dedication and commitment to supporting the Santa Cruz County community for decades, uh, for over two decades, his past, present and future contributions and efforts will always be greatly appreciated by commission members, RTC staff, and most importantly, the Santa Cruz County community. I'm gonna come and bring you this. Um, thank, thank you, you so much. I'll move approval of this resolution that's in front of us. Second. Do um, adopt this resolution, <laughs> um, and uh, a second, and we'll uh, go ahead and take the vote on that, and then we'll take comments from folks who want to say something. Okay, yeah. or we can maintain. Let's take comments first. I think we're going to adopt it. <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> Commissioner Rockin. Well, Commissioner Shepard. Next. I, I want to join in what's certainly going to be a plethora of very positive comments about your public service, Mark. Um, we we have a right to expect that our assembly members will vote well on important issues, and you certainly know that. But um, we don't, I don't think you can always expect that the people you elect are going to be real leaders that um, do more than just vote on things that come in front of them in, the, in a way that makes us happy. You really have... Um, shaped the legislation that uh, others vote on and it's made a real difference i mean there's no literally no one in the assembly who can i think make a claim to be an environmental champion that exceeds your own right to that claim in general and particularly transportation issues within that so um I don't want to take a long time in making my comments, but really deeply uh, from my heart, I feel like you, you've just been a wonderful public servant for us and the public of Santa Cruz County and the state of California. Thanks for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Um, I first met you when you became a supervisor and worked with you at the board and I've always appreciated your dedication. One of the memories I have of you, and I don't know if you're still keeping up with it, but that you swam the English Channel. <laughs> that was something that was uh, a big deal when it occurred. And so it's certainly stayed in my mind. I, I, I want to echo all the comments um, Mike made. and just express my appreciation for all your years of public service and wish you the best as you move on. 
uh, to whatever you're going to do next. So thank you. thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Stone, he had to bring up the crystal ball. Um, <laughs> Mark Stone was an outstanding commissioner and has been such a great assembly member also, but he's also just such a team player and provides these like personal touches. So at one point on the commission, he gave me this very cloudy rock that he claimed as my crystal ball that I could never really quite tell what it was. But he also is such a team player. He was on a... Um, Santa Cruz triathlon event or something with Corey Coletti, who was our bike planner for many years, and Corinna Prushnik, who was our um, public information officer and elderly disabled transportation advisory committee. And Corinna regular brings up that you and Corey were just like the superstar swimmer and bicyclist. But you guys brought everyone in on the team, and um, she really appreciated being part of that team. And you know, so we, we do multimodal transportation here in so many different ways and Mark's been part of that. So thank you. And I also want to give a shout out to his longtime staffer, Maureen McCarthy, who has been just so responsive all the time for us and a huge champion in getting Mark to sign letters uh, of support <laughs> and uh, for all of our different projects. So thank you, Mark. And I hope you'll, we'll see you more in Santa Cruz County, maybe testifying at public hearings and other things. Sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. We, we do have a, a couple more comments from members of the commission who are with us virtually. So um, wanna make sure they have an opportunity. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, I see your hand up. Thanks, Before. Sharon. I wanna thank Mark for all the years of uh, public service. Uh, I believe I knew Mark back when he was a Scotts Valley School Board member, you know, so he goes way back and of course he lives in Scotts Valley. And I just want to commend him on the wide spectrum of service that he's done. In particular, for this is for Scotts Valley when he helped with our tax measure when the governor vetoed it. And he came forward and said, yes, we're going to get, allow the people of Scotts Valley to vote on a three quarter cents tax measure, which pretty much saved the city. But so... I want to thank you for that, Mark, and for all the public service that you've really done and helped help, uh, countywide and in particular the city of Scotts Valley. Thank you. Hey, uh, Kristen Brown, you are next. Thank you. Uh, Assembly member, we are all so very grateful to have had you representing us as such an amazing leader in the Assembly. I'm grateful for all that you've done for the city of Capitola, for the entire county of Santa Cruz, your, your whole district. Um, you know, and personally, in the, in the five years that I worked across the hall from your office in uh, uh, Sam Farr's office, I had the opportunity to get to know you and to get to know your staff, including Maureen and Kieran and Paige. And it was truly a pleasure um, to do so, to get to know you and, and your staff. We, again, are so grateful. Thank you for all of your service. Thank you. Commissioner Hurst, I'll call on you next. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, greetings from Watsonville, Mark. Uh, thank you for always paying attention to us and helping us out on uh, difficult circumstances and always being a friend to uh, South County and Watsonville. So hats off to you, and thank you very much. Thanks, Lord. Okay, and then Commissioner Quinn, I, I believe, is also uh, has a hand up there. I want to make sure you get a chance to speak. Commissioner Quinn. Did that work? We can hear you. Oh, finally. Oh, I just wanted to say a big thanks to Assemblyman Stone and uh, looking forward to further dialogue in the future. Hey, um, I, I, I want to, uh, oh, okay, let's see. We've got Commissioner's hands coming up. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to echo. Uh, Ms. Brown's uh, comments, uh, your support at Capitola has been great uh, when we need funds to work on various projects. Um, unfortunately, I never had a chance to work with you directly uh, except for seeing you at meetings. And one thing I really appreciate, and I know uh, Capitola citizens appreciate it, we always look forward to when you came to city council and gave us an update. Uh, your updates were extraordinary. Uh, you gave us a real good feel of the conditions that are going on in Sacramento, the various um, things that were in front of the ledge. 
Um, I don't know that anyone else has done as good a job, at least in Capitola, than you have in that regard. So I personally appreciate that. And I've heard many comments from our citizens how much they appreciate that too. So I just want to say that and good luck in your future. I'm sure you're looking forward to it. And uh, hey, you don't have to trim your beard as much anymore, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Right, uh, Commissioner Hernandez, you're up. Uh oh. Thank you. Yes, um, you know, I was, I was just want to say I want to echo what uh, the other commissioners have said, and I want to thank you for all your work in Sacramento, and and thank you for all your work in Watsonville as well. Um, and then we hope to see more more of you around here, you know, at the, all of, all the local functions and all the uh, all the hearings as well, uh, you know. And thank you for again for all your all your work um, and your leadership on on environmental issues over at the Moss Landing Lab. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, I uh, now want to give Guy Preston an opportunity to. Speak. So when I came into this position as RTZ executive director, um, uh, assembly member Stone was already in the assembly and no longer a commissioner. Um, so I didn't get the opportunity to work with him directly in this role as a, you know, when Mark was a commissioner. I was very um, pleased to make my first legislative trip up to Sacramento and meet you for the first time in your office. And, and I was very wide-eyed and excited about all of the great things we were gonna do. And, and you looked at me and sincerely um, let me know of the challenges I was going to have in this position. And, and, and your honesty, I think really came across, um, but it came across in a way that you let me know that I would have your support and that you would be there for the commission to ensure that our projects could move forward and that I would be successful in my position. And you were always there for me and your staff has been there for me. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Could I add something? Sure. Um, I want to thank Rachel for reminding me to thank your staff. Um, because as a staff member myself, I know how much work the staff does in support of the elected officials. Uh, Maureen and the rest of your, your staff have been, as you know, super important in making you as successful as you've been. So I think it's, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank her and your other staff members for all the work that they do. Thank you. As any elected knows, we are not successful without our staff at all. We're the front, they do all the work. I'm just gonna take the chair's privilege to say a couple more things. Uh, I, I just wanna say, so echoing everything I've heard from my colleagues here, um, ever since the I met you when you were running for, uh, decided to run for Board of Supervisors, I think you were thinking about it. I went all the way to Scotts Valley <laughs> to talk with you. We were working on some uh, county policy issues. And, and just ever since that day that I met you, um, seeing your work, I just, I just think that you, you really are, um, the, you exemplify public service. Um, you really do, uh, you, you care deeply about our community. It shows in, you know, all aspects of your work. Um, you are a problem solver. Uh, you think critically and deeply about policy and you provide leadership in areas of environmental and, and social justice really, um, that are so needed, uh, in our, our state and our community at this time. And, um, you know, you, you just, I can't say enough. Um, it's been great to see you uh, work in Sacramento and, and represent us and um, wishing you all the best uh, you. in your future endeavors. And uh, Maureen as well, thank you for all the work you've done to um, keep our assembly member doing the, the good work. So I think that will... Uh, that we'll close. Applause, I think appropriately. Yes, I think a round of applause. More than appropriate. Absolutely. Really. Thank you. Okay. So we've uh, we've done a little 
uh, moving around to the agenda, let's get back to our next item and get us back on Chair track. Brown. I um, Chair Brown. Yes. Did you want to finish up the vote? on that oh uh, i'm sorry that's i forgot that we yeah it was like already done in my mind we should take a vote on uh, approval of that resolution that <laughs> assembly member stones out the door with okay <laughs> we'll go ahead and take a roll call commissioner bertrand i approve commissioner sandy brown aye commissioner johnson aye commissioner alternate hurst aye commissioner alternate hernandez aye Commission Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Alternate uh, Quinn, who- are Yes. You? Okay, great, I can hear you. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. He might be gone, so Commissioner um, Jenny Johnson. Maybe they're both gone. Aye. Okay. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Christian Brown. Aye. And Commissioner Rodkin. All right. That passes unanimously. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So we'll now come back around. Uh, and we, uh, I think maybe since item, tw is it okay if we do item 23 now and then come back around? Okay. Um, just because we were kind of already talking about these issues and um, want to make sure that questions get answered and we, wrap this up. So, okay, so we're going to move on to item 23. We will hold item 17 through 20 till after item 23. Clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, the questions were on item 21, if I remember. Yes. Um, so we're going to do that. First, we'll go ahead and, and do, and yes. 23. Yes, we'll go ahead and do it. Um, they're kind of related because a lot of them are about the funding, um, but I'll um, go ahead and ask Rachel uh, Morricone to respond to some of the questions that came up in item 21 before we look at the budget. And I'm actually going to defer to Sarah Christensen okay. since most of the questions were on the rail and highway programs, which she manages. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Sarah. So um, there was a question about uh, the timing of the cycle three application and whether we can wait on the um, submittal of that application. And uh, staff does not recommend that because these funds are available in two year cycles. And our project uh, falls within the program years for construction. It will be construction ready within the program years and therefore eligible. It meets all of the requirements of the guidelines for the grant program. And our, as you know, our projects are highly competitive. So it's better to get it um, constructed sooner rather than later um, and not defer further delay any um, applications for funding. Um, there was also a question about why the overall costs went up. As you recall, earlier this year, I made several presentations about the Cycle 3 project as we were developing it. And um, the cost did go up. And the reason is because we added more multimodal improvements. We actually um, went back and forth with Metro staff and um, they pitched a uh, many, many transit improvements to be added to our project. And that was um, adding costs, but also adding a whole lot of benefit. And so we um, we squeezed those in um, and then the county further refined their multimodal project cost estimates, which went up a little bit. And then this, um, as I mentioned, we updated the cost estimates for the, um, the big contract, the highway one and segment 12. Project. So that's why the costs have been refined and they did increase, uh, but also the benefits have increased substantially as well. And um, another question about CEQA and the, um, the VMT requirements and how we will meet those requirements. The Highway 1 and Segment 12 project actually reduces VMT. Uh, it's a multimodal project. It does include auxiliary lanes. It also includes bus on shoulder. So it offsets the vehicle miles traveled. And uh, the addition of the rail trail, um, looking at a holistic model of the countywide vehicle miles traveled, the project does reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled. So we are compliant in that way. Um, and then there was one question about the EIR recirculation effort. We have not um, we have not gotten any kind of revised cost estimate. And if we did, we would 
potentially bring it back to the commission, um, but we don't anticipate um, bringing that back anytime soon. So, thank you. And if I could just add, we, we earlier discovered that not circulating that immediately doesn't slow down any of our actual projects. So that's the reason why it's possible to not respond immediately to the, the judge expressed an interest in it being done, but it was pretty open and vague about exactly when and made very clear that it was not going to stop any of the same work. Correct. Okay. So uh, thank you for the clarifications. And uh, we will now hear about amendments to the fiscal year 2022-23 budget and work program. Uh, in relation to the previous item, uh, we have a staff report from Tracy New, our Director of Finance and Budget. Welcome, Tracy. Morning, Commissioners. Thank you. Um, each year, the RTC receives revenue estimates from the County of Santa Cruz, State Controller's Office, and HDL companies to inform the development of a new fiscal year budget. Sure. <laughs> um, Mark. Staff present the budget to the, presented the budget to the Budget Administration and Personnel Committee on October 13th for recommendation to the Commission for adoption. The fiscal year 22-23 initial budget was adopted by the Commission in April. We have amended the budget based on project status and funding needs, including programming funds for grant matches and carryover from the prior fiscal year. Many have been done as part of the major fall budget amendment in previous fiscal years. And this um, fiscal year 22-23 proposed amendment includes an amendment to the Transportation Development Act allocation of $1,368,083 in additional distribution of TDA revenues, an amendment to the overall work program to include grant funds, Measure D carryover from fiscal year 21-22, and proposed changes to the Measure D five-year plans for the highway, active transportation, and rail categories as approved by the commission in part on item 21. Staff continue to work with our consultants seeking input and information about market trends, revenue forecasts, and possible impacts to our major funding sources. Staff um, and the Budget and Personnel Committee recommend that the Commission approve the fiscal year 22-23 proposed amended budget for RTC and Measure D. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from commissioners? I see uh, Commissioner Hurst, your hand. Go for it. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I just wanted to check and see if this uh, budget proposal would uh, delay or postpone any uh, uh, funding for the uh, Watsonville portion of the rail trail. I am going to defer that. And if so, what are we gonna do? So the Measure D five-year plans that you just approved do shift funds for um, the remaining segment 18 elements as well as 19 and 20 to later years. Um, we are anticipating finishing the design work on that as part of the electric rail and trail project. And so that is um, initially we had anticipated or Watsonville staff had anticipated moving forward with the remaining sections of segment 18 right now but due to a lot of regulatory requirements and right-of-way issues, um, it made sense to look at those remaining sections in um, concert with the transit planning. Well, just, just know that uh, we're anxious to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I do not see any more uh, commissioner hands up. We'll take it out to the public. I do not see any hands up there, so we'll bring it back to the commission. Move the staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. I would like to make a comment. And Commissioner Schifrin, take it away. One of the um, parts of the, the revised budget is to allocate the surplus from the last couple of years, and it's a quite a significant surplus. Uh, my concern, which I raised at the Budget Administration Committee, and I wanted to um, and, you know, make the whole commission aware of it, is that our TDA revenues are as are down 
uh, in the first quarter by over $300,000 below what was projected. So I had a concern about whether, um, you know, allocating all of the surplus at this time could um, cause problems later on in the year if the economy continues to go the way it's going. I raised this concern with staff and um, the director responded in a way that made it, see, you know, that supported the staff recommendation that, you know, yes, there was uncertainty, but it still made sense to uh, go forward with the with the proposal. And I'm willing to support that. Um, what I wondered about, though, was whether it would make sense, and I want to just ask other commissioners what they think, to approve the allocation, but maybe hold back the distribution of half of the surplus until we do our budget in March, so that we know that in fact, we won't be needing to either use some of next year's money to um, increase the reserves or uh, have to uh, buy it and by therefore having to use the reserves this year to meet our obligations. So I just, I, I just want to raise that uh, as uh, Assembly Member Stone mentioned, it's a it's an uncertain time economically. There is uh, a, a need for uh, seen in the legislature for caution. And I just uh, wanted to share that with the commission uh, to see whether others would prefer to wait for the full uh, distribution. Um, although uh, I totally support the recommendation for the uh, allocation. Commissioner Rockton. I'm wearing my transit district hat here. Um, we get like 85% of that or something and some significant portion of it. And we would be the most directly affected by decision to put off the funding till March. The plan, if we just spent some really detailed time on this at our retreat, um, the, our ability to not buy some CNG buses, you know, because they were cheaper and go, you know, and uh, go to a, only buy electric or hyd uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses, totally depends on that money um and that's only one of the things the other issue has to do with our ability to um look seriously at the increasing frequency on the major routes which we think is the real key to bringing back our ridership so it it does make a big difference to us i, I understand your concern it's not a, you know not a ridiculous point to be raised but um if, if we can't depend on that money at this i mean we'd be better off deciding at a later date that we have to like step it back because you know we have to cut back and what we can do next year or something that would be much better for us than basically scotching the plans that we have right now to to move ahead with both the electrification of our fleet and the uh, the other stuff that we've done I, I think it'd be a serious concern for us so I, i'm in favor of going with the staff recommendation noting your point and obviously we should continue to monitor that and it's we're not going to spend it all in January. So the, the issue really is to you know monitor it. And if we start to see that there's a trend developing that's as bad as it might be and stuff, then you know maybe we need to begin changing what we do. But I wouldn't do it right out of the gate. I, I would wait till we have an indication. And typically these uh, estimates are based on the county auditor and um, they usually have had fairly, fairly conservative kinds of estimates of what the revenues are going to be. It's not like they, they're out there you know, predicting all kinds of stuff happening that's not going to happen. So your point's well taken. It might not, even their conservative estimate may not come to fruition, but I, I don't think we were in a position where the transit industry could suffer that kind of a cut. It'd be significant for us. Well, let me just say, as I said, I'm willing to support the staff recommendation. I, I just wanted to you know, bring the concern forward. It could affect the budget next year and the amount that the transit district gets next year. But I guess the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush is, uh, is, uh, is a strategy here, and I support it. You have secured your I told you so rights right there, Andy. Good work. <laughs> uh, uh, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. At the, at the risk of sounding, <clears throat> excuse me, at the risk of providing comments that are redundant to uh, what Commissioner Rotkin just said, I, I also am in, in support of the staff recommendation. You know, we, we just heard from the Metro presentation this morning, um, the goals to increase ridership at a time when they're already working hard to restore the service and the ridership and uh, transmission our, or excuse me, transition our fleet. And so I, I would really encourage um, moving forward with the staff recommendation as is. 
Okay, thank you for your comments. Bring it back to, um, I think we've, I think everybody's okay. spoken who's uh, <laughs> gonna do that. So we'll, we'll go ahead and take a vote. Commissioner Bertrand. I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Aye. Commission Alternate Hurst. Aye. Commission Alternate Hernandez. Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commission Aye. Alternate. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Commission Alternate Johnson. Virginia Aye. Johnson. Thank you. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. And Commissioner Rodkin. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay. We will now uh, return to uh, previous items that we postponed. Uh, so we'll start uh, back, come back around to item 17, commissioner reports. Are there commissioners who have um, anything they'd like to report to commission? Oh, thank you so much, though. Watching that. Uh, okay, seeing none, we will uh, move on to item 18. This is a nomination committee for chair and vice chair, an oral report from me. I just wanted to let commissioners know that I have asked uh, Commissioner McPherson and Commissioner Rotkin to serve on this committee with me, and we will bring recommendations for uh, chair and vice chair to our December meeting. Uh, anybody have any questions about that? I agree to serve on the committee. Okay, uh, moving along then, we have uh, uh, item 19 is our director's reports and we'll turn it back to Guy Preston. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, I have a few updates. Um, um, the first is on the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Complete Street Project. RTC staff is currently doing outreach to gain community input on draft engineering concepts for transportation solutions along Highway 9 as part of the San Lorenzo Valley schools circulation and access study. The study area covers Highway 9 between the southern intersection of Glen Arbor Road and Graham Hill Road and includes site access and circulation improvements at the three San Lorenzo Valley schools and multimodal transportation improvements along Highway 9. Based on data collected and past community input, initial engineering concepts to improve circulation in and around the SLB schools complex have been drafted and include pedestrian, bicycle, transit, and operational improvements. A virtual workshop took place, at, took place last night via Zoom, and an in-person workshop will take place tonight from 6 to 7.30 at the Felton Community Hall. More information can be found on the RTC web, website homepage under news and updates. Um, I have an update on the construction of the Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Cycle 2 project. Um, I am pleased to announce that the county has completed all the pre-construction work and has advertised for construction bids for their SoCal Drive Complete Streets project from La Fonda Drive to State Park Drive. This project is a component of RTC's successful Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Project, which was awarded over 107 million in SB1 funds for multimodal improvements on the corridor, including Highway 1. Improvements for this project include pavement repair, buffered and protected bike lanes, sidewalk gap closures, crosswalk enhancements, and adaptive signal control with transit prioritization. Construction bids are expected to be open on November 11, or excuse me, November 17. Um, I have an update on the Scotts Creek Bridge Replacement and Ecosystem Restoration Project. Last week, the Resource Conservation District was joined by State Senator John Laird to host uh, a interagency field meeting to celebrate the Scotts Creek Coastal Resiliency Project. Leaders from natural resource and transportation agencies gathered to commensurate a major milestone of this project, and that's the completion of the project initiation document. That's a Caltrans document. And um, uh, celebrate nearly a decade of interagency collaboration to advance this new paradigm for integrated infrastructure and ecosystem resilience planning. 
This meeting resulted in a further commitment by agencies to build on our foundation of project champions to help move this effort through the critical planning and implementation steps ahead. If you're not familiar with Scotts Creek, it's a very low lining bridge with quite a bit of fill that was placed um, in a very sensitive ecosystem and it is um, uh, threatened by uh, sea level rise. Uh, the coastal, uh, the Scotts Creek Coastal Resiliency Project located in Northern Santa Cruz County is an integrated bridge replacement and ecological restoration project with multiple benefits. This project will improve community and highway resilience to climate change and sea level rise. will implement a major recovery action for endangered coho salmon and a suite of other uh, listed species. will improve coastal access and will also create jobs amongst other benefits. For nearly 10 years, the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and Caltrans, along with our state and federal resource agency partners have collaborated to re-envision how we plan for major transportation infrastructure projects by focusing on first understanding the needs of the ecosystem, then designing infrastructure and restoration activities together to meet those needs. These projects have traditionally been extremely difficult to fund, but the new emphasis on climate sustainability and the cooperative efforts of all jurisdictions provide a path forward for Scotts Creek and other coastal resiliency projects. I expressed the commission's support for this project and how we plan to use this collaborative model to advance sustainable planning and project implementation efforts throughout the region. We are currently working on our next cycle of Caltrans planning grants and are looking uh, at two locations on the North Coast for uh, similar projects to Scotts Creek. Um, regarding the AB 361 findings that you just made as part of the consent calendar, at the last commission meeting, I expected the commission to be able to continue to make AB 361 findings and hold remote or hybrid meetings for all participants, including commissioners and um, committee members for all of 2023. However, since that time, I have learned that the governor plans to lift the state of emergency at the end of February, 2023. If so, the RTC will need to start holding regular in-person meetings effective in March. For regular in-person meetings, RTC, RTC staff will provide hybrid options for members of the public when the facilities contains the technology necessary for hybrid meetings. Commissioners for commission meetings and committee members for committee meetings will need to attend in person unless they attend from another public location where the agenda had been posted in accordance with the Brown Act, or if they have provided sufficient justification for the very limited just cause or emergency circumstances provided under the new uh, legislation AB 2449, which I discussed at our last meeting. Staff will provide more information to commissioners on allowances for AB 2449 circumstances for remote attendance as we gain a greater understanding of the legislation and develop a system for implementation. And that concludes my director's report. Guy, would you like to um, also announce our 50th anniversary? Oh, yes. Um, Yesenia, you, you may have to help me out with this because I don't have the date in front of me, but we have decided on a date for our 50th anniversary um, open house, which we will have at our office here in Santa Cruz, our new office. We are going to do a very informal um, uh, open house where staff is going to be available to members of the public. We would like the commissioners to come and make themselves available at certain times uh, and do so in a way that we don't violate the Brown Act but give the uh, public an opportunity to celebrate um, the accomplishments that we had. We'll have several stations around the office for people to engage with staff and see um, some of the great work that we've done. And the date on that, Yesenia? So that is scheduled for Thursday, December 8th from 2 to 7 p.m. Um, it seems like a lengthy time, but we wanted to make sure that the community had an opportunity to come out for those that are working during um, the day. And so do expect an invitation in your email. We will also be reaching out to you um, to help us locate some of our previous um, commissioners and committee members and maybe consultants that uh, we don't have information for. 
Thank you. Commissioner Schiffer. Is there any reason it couldn't be scheduled at a special meeting so all the commissioners could come there at once? Um, members of the public could come and the, would, the agenda would be to celebrate the 50th anniversary and not take any action. But it would be a, you know, a commission meeting that um, because it seems a little cumbersome to have people coming and going at different times. Your uh, parliamentary skills are um, duly noted, and I see absolutely no reason why we can't do that. That's an excellent idea, and um, we will move forward in that direction unless I hear otherwise. Thank you. All right. So we are now moving on to our next item. I believe we are on Caltrans. Report and uh, it looks like we Orchid Monroe Choa is here today. Thank you for your patience. And thank you for your patience. Absolutely. You're on mute. Hey. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Orchid Monroe Choa and I'm the branch chief for regional planning and local development review in District 5. I'm here on behalf of Tim Gubbins today. And I have uh, some announcements. Uh, the first one would be that this Friday is the last opportunity to submit public comment for the 23-24 Sustainable Community Grant Guidelines. We can review, um, you can review and submit comments online through Caltrans webpage. Uh, we expect a call for applications to go out uh, near the end of December or beginning of January. Uh, regardless of when the application opens, applicants will have at least eight weeks to submit a grant application. Um, there are still two upcoming workshops planned to discuss comments received for the guidelines. Those will be happening November 9th and 10th, which is next Wednesday and Thursday. Information can be found on the same website, which is easily Googled through the search term Sustainable Communities Grant. Um, another one is that the Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program, TourSIP Program Guidelines Cycle 6 are also for review with public comments due this upcoming Monday. Uh, comments can be submitted via email to uh, TURSIP comments at dot.ca.gov and comments on draft guidelines are due uh, November 7th. Also a reminder to motorists is that as we go into the wet season, please be mindful that vehicle behavior may change, uh, that folks might need more time to stop to react to road conditions and that as, as the days become dark early in pedestrians and cyclists um, are still out and about completing their daily tasks. So please be mindful. Also, winter, under, with, under winter conditions, um, you know, as they begin to please remember that Caltrans has a customer service request web link uh, for roadway concerns, such as like debris, uh, roadway, clogged or slow uh, drains, and other such maintenance concerns. And that could be um, emailed at csr.dot.ca.gov. So if not, um, you could reach out to your regional planner and Paul Gerges, and uh, we could get that information with you. That's it. Thank you. Any questions from commissioners? Okay, seeing none, we'll take it out to the public. Uh, we have one hand up, Brian Trailnell. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, Thank you for the time. I actually wanted to comment on the director report. My my only comment, and I'll keep it short, is um, about the issue of hybrid meetings. Um, it's good, I guess, that you're keeping it for the public. But I think since this is a transportation committee or agency, you should really put a focus on keeping that capability. It, it's absolutely and very critical that um, the commissioners have the ability to work remote for these meetings. Um, you know, 10, 12 years ago, I started really participating in these meetings and I was have to drive down to Santa Cruz or Watsonville, and sit in these meetings, it's painful. Um, the, no offense, it's just, a you know, we really need to keep moving in the direction of um, of the next gen uh, next uh, capability, so to say, but I'll, I'll shorten it up. But I just really want to um, 
encourage you to go after that requirement that commissioners have to come in and not prevent, uh, not allow them to do that to the committee. We absolutely need to keep that hybrid capability. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. And I apologize for not opening out uh, the, to the public on the ED's report. Um, your comment has been noted. Okay, uh, so we are now going to move into closed session. Our uh, our last item is going to be in closed session and we will be reviewing uh, the public employee, employee performance evaluation for our executive director. Uh, do we have any reportable action? Uh, we will likely have uh, the potential at least for a reportable action at the end. Okay, so, um, so we will return or at least uh, I will return with uh, uh, Mr. Mattis to uh, report out on closed session actions. Um, and uh, with that, we'll- um, Before you do it, oh, is it clear yes, to the ahead. people who are, the commissioners on remote, what the, they have to go out and then come back on another number, right? Cool. That is correct, yes. So- the, the, the link? Yes, that was emailed to everyone again this uh, morning to please do look for that. It either came from CTV or Zoom. Got it. It's a separate link. Correct. So yes, thank you for, for the reminder. So uh, commissioners who are joining us remotely, please do look for that link and sign back in. We will see you in closed session in just a couple of minutes. to our report out from closed session for today's Regional Transportation Commission meeting. And I'm gonna turn it over to our council, Steve Mattis. Thank you, it, now it's coming through, thank you. Thank you, Chair Brown. The um, commission just concluded the closed session that had two items, the evaluation of the executive director and labor negotiations related to the executive director. Um, following that closed session, the commission did take an action by an 8-0 vote. Uh, the commissioner noted that Mr. Preston received an exemplary evaluation and that he's met the contractual standards under his, con his employment contract for a step increase to level E as in Edward, effective December 3rd, 2022. And so that's the commission's direction and authority is to implement that uh, step increase under his previously approved contract. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I will just add uh, such a, a valuable resource, uh, wonderful uh, leader and uh, always helpful to commissioners and, and the public. So uh, that with that, we have an announcement about our next meeting. Our The Regional Transportation Commission will meet next on Thursday, December 1st at 9 a.m. And um, our next transportation policy workshop meeting is scheduled for Thursday, December 15th at 9 a.m. Uh, see you there, if not before. Thanks, everyone. And we're adjourned.